So he has this ancient scroll. And can you imagine the care and the value that they would put on a piece of paper like this? Handing it to him. He reads it. And then he folds it right back up. And his comment to them was, today the scripture has been fulfilled. There's a strange story out there about an elderly couple walking out of church one Sunday. The wife said to her husband, did you see the strange hat Mrs. O'Brien was wearing? No, I didn't, replied the husband. Well, Bill Smith badly needs a haircut, doesn't he? Uh, sorry, I didn't notice. You know John, said the wife impatiently. John, sometimes I wonder what you really get out of church. <laughs> People get all different things out of church, depending, it would seem, on what they expect when they go into the church. For example, I wonder what the people who were in the synagogue in today's gospel were expecting to get out of that particular service. Certainly, they did not expect Jesus to stand up and read a portion of scripture, let alone comment on it. His sermon was and is one of the shortest sermons on record. Simply, today the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. What did that message mean to the people in the synagogue? And what does it mean to you and I today? To the people in the synagogue, I suggest it meant that Jesus was the promised Messiah, the anointed one sent by God to redeem his people. But it also means the same thing for us today. Christ loosens sinners from the bonds of sin, guilt, and corruption. Luke places this story very near the beginning of Jesus' ministry because it is the foundation of the gospel of Luke and Acts. He emphasizes God's openness to the Gentiles. This favoritism offended the Jews and eventually led to Christ's crucifixion. Christ was rejected by the multitude who heard him and was crucified because of their sins. However, we must honor and obey him as Savior, as the Son of God. So as he was rejected by the multitude who heard them, they still crucified him. By this time in our journey through the New Testament, Jesus has already been tempted in the wilderness. He was prepared for the experience because of the foundation built by attending services in the synagogue, starting when he was just a child. That's why it's vital that our children hear scripture, digest scripture, and keep scripture. The best way for us to prepare to have a strong faith, especially through our attendance at church, is to digest everything that we hear, even the music. Isaiah's commission as read by Jesus is similar to the Great Commission, namely to bring good news and proclaim the release to the captives, restore the sight of the blind, free the oppressed. This actually sets Christ's agenda, and it's also our commission. Jesus' ministry involved loving the unloved and serving the undeserved. He wants us to do the very same today. Humans are weak, both spiritually and physically. And what Jesus is saying is like this new revolution going on, especially when it refers to the ending of the world and creating a new. When the poor hear the good news, when captives are set free, and when the oppressed are liberated, God is working in the lives and in each one of our lives 
The revolution is about to begin only through Jesus Christ. Jesus knew exactly what people needed to hear that day. He knew exactly what he wanted to share with them. All of the people in the synagogue and all of us here today, all the poor, the hungry, the oppressed, the imprisoned, and the blind, Christ looks beyond that surface to the core of our very souls. He wants us to repent. He wants us to make a radical shift in how we see ourselves. That's the true doctrine of the Trinity. It's interwoven here. He, Jesus, is the Son of God, and he is uniquely qualified to help us. He sets us free because of his death and resurrection. It's a victory over sin and death. But only if we stop trying to solve our problems ourselves and turn to God instead. He is the only one that can do that. We are all captives to something. All of us can wake up to God's anointing power, the power that constantly inspires, guides, soothes, comforts, welcomes, and transforms us. When Jesus read the scripture in the synagogue, Jesus announced a jubilee, a forgiveness of sin debt. In Luke's version of the Lord's Prayer, which is found in Luke 11.3, there's a sentence that reads like this. Forgive us our debts, for we ourselves forgive each one who is in debt to us. The biblical jubilee was held every 50 years when fields lay fallow, families returned to their ancestral homelands, debts were canceled, and slaves set free. The jubilee restored a rough equality between families and clans. The inevitable increase in inequality and injustice over the years had to be leveled every half century. Faith in a sovereign God was reflected in the structures of social and economic life, which in turn echoed the pattern of God's realm. Wouldn't that be something if we were ready for a jubilee? Wouldn't that be something if we were praying for a jubilee? A community starting afresh. Jesus' jubilee allows us to have a fresh start in our daily walk with him. The Jubilee is a time in which followers of Christ are told that God's promises shall come true in the midst and that God will favor us with his many blessings. The reality of God's love is that it embraces and welcomes the least of these in the community. All we have to do is remember that short sermon Jesus gave. Inasmuch as you do for the least of these, you do for me. Jesus was the architect who designed the splendor of new theology. A new sense of presence in the glory of God found not written in the walls of the tabernacle, but within the structures of us. He treasured the past and honored the ancient teachings of the Jews. He fed his soul from the ancient roles of the scripture, especially during his temptation out in the wilderness. But he looked to the present and the future. Jesus' challenge was and is for today. It is for us. God is with us today, and his call to action can be frightening. Sometimes we might feel overwhelmed with pleas for support, and we often wonder how we should respond and what good will it really do. But I say to you, we must remain steadfast and true to Christ's will to help the less fortunate. 
because Jesus' words in the synagogue are words of hope and inspiration for the oppressed, the hopeless, and the discouraged. We can and must build Christ's community of faith right here, right where we are, right in this block, right in this building, right in this town, right in this community. Caring for people was Jesus' main concern, and it must be ours today. So what do you think Jesus would say if he was asked to preach today? If he walked in and said, Pastor Deb, let me come up to your pulpit. First of all, I don't think he'd ask for a pulpit. I think he'd come right down the center aisle and be right within you. Why would we think that the intensity of Christ's message would diminish, especially in a culture that is so filled with commercialism and greed? Do you think he'd be any less excited or passionate? The Spirit is obviously upon us because we do reach out to the poor and the captive and the blind and the oppressed. Can we say that that's why God anointed us and thus we dare to be his followers? Is that the mission of the church today or do we say that was Christ's mission? But we're still hammering out our own vision statement. Many of you have heard of the old TV and radio host, Art Linkletter. I used to love it. I remember I was in preschool, and my pre I was in an in-home preschool, and the preschool teacher had Art Linkletter on TV. And they had a program that was called Kids Say the Darndest Things. Do you remember? One of the most annoying questions children will ask and I know Brinkley has turned to, and this is why. Why? They ask because they're basically curious. Growing minds, they starve for that understanding. But that thirst for knowledge often disappears as they get older. Is it because their curiosity is stifled by impatient adults? I remember saying to my kids, too many times, just because it is. That's why. I'm not proud to say that. Is it because they and we get used to things and stop asking questions? I hear a lot of you come in and you come and talk to me and you say, why? Why? You're still seeking. Is our curiosity stifled by impatient peers? Or is it because we get used to things and just stop asking the questions? The word of God is both exciting and frightening at the same time because of what it says about how we choose to live and how far away we are from God. So we can refuse to listen we can refuse to believe. We can refuse to allow his word to make a difference for us. But regardless, it's still true. The word of God stands forever because the word of God gives us life. Jesus' obedience to God created the very foundation upon which God can build and enter the temple called our heart. Jesus' one-sentence sermon that day in the synagogue was the shortest in history, but it was the most powerful. Amen. Amen.